Having a Gas is the podcast that talks to the great and the good of the creative industries, and in particular finds out what makes great music for film, for TV, for commercials, for dancing to, for cooking to, for f***ing to, and more. Today I'm having a gas with Rob Henderson, a promising young intellectual researching human behaviour at Cambridge University. Rob grew up in adverse conditions moving between foster homes in LA before enlisting in the US Air Force and setting himself on the road to one of the greatest universities in the world. Yeah, is that a sufficient introduction for you or have I missed anything out? Nope, that's, that's about uh, the gist of it. Good stuff. How long have you been in Cambridge? Uh, so I'm, I've been here, I can't believe this, but I've been here almost three years now. I arrived in September of 2018 and I think the reason why it feels like it, uh, the time has sort of flown by weirdly is because of this lockdown. It feels like the last year hasn't really happened or, yeah. you know, just like the memory of it. Uh, you know, there's, there's actually some interesting psychology research that time seems to uh, go by faster if you engage in the same habits, the same routines every single day. Yes. Uh, because your brain isn't picking up on any new information. And so it sort of goes on this autopilot. And that's how the last year has felt is just like every day is the same as the last. Um, haven't been able to travel as much as I wanted to and see as much of England and as much of Europe as I wanted to. Uh, but yeah, you know, Cambridge is still, you know, if you're going to be locked down, there are worse places to be than, than Cambridge. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I, I do know exactly whereof you speak talking about the distortions of time. There's a, there's a really popular YouTuber you might be familiar with called uh, Vsauce. Um, and uh, his, his real name is Michael Stevens. And I think he works for Google full time outside of that. But he did a, a great episode about that recently talking about the phenomenon you just described. And one thing that I noticed recently looking back was that the beginning of the first lockdown, because everything was so absolutely novel and completely unexperienced certainly for me. Um, the first month felt like it, about three or four months. I, there were things that I thought had happened th three weeks into it or four weeks into it that were actually five or six days into the first lockdown. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, looking back, like, I, I mean, I can't believe it's April, you know, like I remember mm. talking about this back, you know, March of 2020. And then when it hit March, 2021, it was like, where did this year go? Yeah. Um, you know, it feels like just a couple of weeks ago it was Christmas and now we're sort of well into spring and yes. yeah, very, very strange how this is all, all unfolded. Yeah. So, uh, how does, um, how's, how's your, what's the, how's your life in the UK? How do you find the tenor of the UK and just the feel of it compared to the U S? Uh, yeah. I and mean, I like it here, you know, like it's, it's, uh, you know, I, I, I'd never been here before, before I came. So I wasn't sure exactly what to expect, you know, other than the movies, yeah. uh, you know, I saw movies take place at places like Oxford or Cambridge or whatever. Um, it is about what I expected. Um, you know, I don't know if Cambridge is necessarily representative of all of England, but uh, I've enjoyed it. I, I like going to London too. Uh, you know, especially like London for a large city, it seems to be, uh, you know, somewhat more affordable than the larger cities in the U S like, uh, New York city, for example. Um, mm -hmm. can, yeah, I, I've, yeah, I like it here. I like. I, I don't know if I would live here after I'm finished, but you know, I, I would definitely come back to visit. Do you have uh, what? Do you have ambitions? Do you have like a vision for what you want to do, where you want to go? Uh, not really. Um, you know, I, I have like a couple of like directions I would want to go down, but I don't have like this big end goal in mind. Mm -hmm. uh, I've just been enjoying my time. Uh, you know, doing doing the research for my PhD, publishing in academic journals. Um, I'm working on a memoir sort of describing, uh, you know, how I ended up here at Cambridge. And yeah, I have a newsletter and a pretty active Twitter account. So just been enjoying, uh, yeah, this stuff so far. That's uh, one of the things that uh, I was really excited. I've been excited to talk to you uh, about, or one of the reasons I've been excited to you. I've seen, I read your... Um, uh, the, the, your long form essay in Quillette about, you know, is it Veblen's theory of the leisure class? Yeah, yeah, Veblen, Thorsten Veblen, he, uh, he had that, the, so he wrote a book in the late 19th century, The Theory of the Leisure Class, and that long form essay I wrote was, you know, sort of my perspective uh, as a sort of update on, on Veblen's idea. Yeah, and I think what, what the, the, the ideas that you've been formulating 
uh, have been, in fact, you know, I'll preface the discussion with this, by the way, in case our, our listeners or any of the audience gets frustrated. Uh, I'm very much a, you know how you get frustrated creatives? You get people who love music so much, but they've never been able to make it. Uh, uh, and I'm, I'm a frustrated intellectual, you know what I mean? I find all this stuff fascinating and gripping, but I cannot sit down to read, <laughs> you know, and I, I, I really struggle with, you know, disciplining ideas, taking things that from the abstract vagueness and getting them into a straight line so they make sense. And I think the work you've been doing has been really useful because it obviously, it touches on the the current culture wars um, and perhaps elucidates, you know, or explains why some of the things have been happening. It's It's a really useful idea. So take some of our listeners through what your update is on the leisure class. Yeah, my update on this, uh, I coined this term uh, luxury beliefs, uh, which, you know, it, it somewhat surprisingly to me anyway, it caught on uh, pretty quickly. So I wrote this sort of, uh, you know, Twitter thread in the midst of 2019, uh, just sort of like somewhat random thoughts as they were popping into mind about how the upper class now uh, signals at status. What are the new symbols of one's social position in society? And then uh, that that Quillette essay was a more fleshed out version, drawing from uh, biology, economics, sociology. A lot of it leaned on on Thorsten Veblen's work. So luxury beliefs are ideas and opinions that confer status on the upper class, while often inflicting costs on the lower classes. And the way I came up with this idea was, you know, I, I would read Veblen and, and Veblen said things like, you know, so again, he was writing the late 1800s and he noticed that the sort of upper class in North America and Europe, they displayed their symbols of wealth with their, their clothing, for example. You know, the men would wear very fancy suits and women would wear these evening gowns, uh, very like delicate and restrictive clothing. Uh, They would carry certain kinds of jewelry, pocket watches, monocles, hats, powdered wigs, all these kinds of things were these sort of material symbols of one's uh, status in society. Well, I thought about what's going on today. Um, We still have an upper class uh, and they still desire to signal their status in some way, but things have changed since, you know, a century or more ago. I think among the upper class, what I've noticed is that it's become somewhat uh, gauche or kind of vulgar now to signal your status with luxury goods, with material goods. And, and at least within some sectors of the upper class, it's, it's almost, uh, it almost reduces your status because like, you know, there's like this uh, environmentally friendly movement, this idea of minimalism, aestheticism, and so on that, you know, if you have these big loud goods, um, you know, maybe you're, you're doing damage to the environment or you're, or in some cases, they accuse you of like overcompensating, or there's just something gauche and and yeah, something you might be fla- so flaunting your privilege, flaunting privilege, right? There's a lot of concern about that too. So the upper class of the past, you know, they would they would wear certain clothes, whereas today you see like tech billionaires, right? Like the famous example of Zuckerberg and the flip flops and the in the cargo shorts, um, you know. So if they're not if the upper class is not displaying their status with luxury goods, at least not as much anymore, how are they doing it? And I claim that they're doing it through their beliefs, their opinions, their ideas. Um, And these ideas tend to be uh, at odds with the beliefs of ordinary, conventional people who maybe don't attend elite universities or don't spend time around people who have lots of money and a lot of leisure time. Uh, and so today, you know, like the leisure class of the past, you know, and, and today it still happens, but you know, they, they might play golf or go beagling or something. Whereas today, a lot of the leisure class, they spend a lot of time on Twitter. They spend a lot of time on social media, sort of signaling back and forth at each other to keep up with whatever the latest trends are. And we can get into specific examples of, of luxury beliefs, But just to close this off, um, you know, this explanation, you know, some people would ask, well, how do you know that upper class people even want to signal their status, you know, their beliefs, you know, maybe things have changed, you know, maybe Mm -hmm. in the past, that's how they were, but today they're not like that anymore. Uh, And this is when I draw on recent research in psychology. So Cameron Anderson at UC Berkeley, uh, some other scholars, I I believe they're they're European scholars, but both in America and in Europe, researchers have basically 
uh, collected data from people asking them about their levels of education, how much money they make, their sort of prestige of their jobs and so on. And then they asked them questions uh, regarding how much they would desire to have influence or status or power. You know, how much would you like to influence other people? How much would you like to uh, hold a position of prominence in society? These kinds of questions. And what the researchers find is that there's a positive correlation between one's current position in society and their desire for social status. So essentially, the higher up you are in the status ladder, the more status you want, which is perhaps somewhat counterintuitive because you might think that, you know, it's the people who don't have much who would really want that status. You know, people on the, the bottom end of that ladder who, you know, are struggling, who have lower incomes and so on, like those are the people who want status, but it's not true. It's the people at the top who actually want more. And if you can't do it through luxury goods, then I claim that you, you, you're going to want to do it through your luxury beliefs. So there's, um, that's a pretty healthy uh, thesis in terms of its size and, and, and how you've articulated it there. And I thought something that might be uh, interesting to explore and something to hang on to this, this work that you've been doing is uh, when someone is, is remembering that someone pointed out to me in 2016. Obviously, were you, you, were you still at Yale in 2016? I was, yep. Yeah. So 2016, we had two relatively upending political events in my country and in yours. And um, I, I, I saw someone on Twitter, I forget who they were, so they'll be anonymous forever, say, um, liberals are always in favor of the working class until they vote the wrong way, at which point they become thick racist proles. <laughs> now that's quite venomously worded, but what it what it looked like to me is it's like uh, is is similar to what you were saying. It's the fact that confusingly, the people more to the left of the political spectrum tended to vote Remain, as in Remain in the European Union, and uh, they, 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 they the, I'm pretty sure the voting data was overwhelmingly metropolitan in you know how you could predict it. So big cities voted Remain, smaller. Uh, m more rural areas tended to vote to leave and, uh, and leave one, of course. But yeah, I noticed just that it was strange. It was like overnight, the people who previously had been champions of the working class were decrying their new enemy as ignorant and you know need in need of education. So it went, yes, this 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 hierarchy thing that you've been describing emerged at, almost out of the void instantaneously. Yeah, yeah, it's very interesting. I mean, I think that of course at the individual level, we all sort of have our reasons for why we hold our beliefs, but. I think that one reason in particular, at least among the upper class, is just this, and, and Veblen wrote about this too. I mean, he had this, you know, the, the way that he wrote in the late, you know, the late 19th century, he had, you know, he said something like the upper classes uh, are afraid of like the, the odiousness of the lower classes. Like they don't want to come into contact with those ideas for fear of contamination. You know, I don't want you to mistake me as being one of the, the proles or the plebes or whatever. And so one way I can do this is to show you just how much I despise Trump or how much I condemn, you know, the sort of Brexit movement or whatever. Um, and so I think things have, have seemed to have taken a shift lately where, you know, sometimes I think like in the past, maybe the more left of center, the more liberal movements were more in favor of the working class back when they could signal their status with their clothes. Hmm. Right. So like if I can wear, you know, really fancy attire, and you know immediately just laying your eyes on me that I'm a member of the upper class, then I can champion whatever I want because you already know my position in society. But if you know I'm wearing flip-flops and cargo shorts and I need you to know that I'm a member of the elite, well, I have to do it through having different beliefs than people who would ordinarily wear flip-flops and cargo shorts. Right. Yeah, so um, it's... Uh Well, it was Rory who brought, brought uh, you to my attention. And Rory, when I was speaking to him, of course, said, um, if you're a chief exec and you cycle to work, that's patently a choice. Is that similar to what you're describing there? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that actually, uh, I, I remember, I listened to that conversation and I loved it, by the way. Um, but that was great. He, what did he said something like, yeah, if you were a bicycle, or yeah, if you if you ride a bicycle to work and you're an executive, you're riding the bike because you want to. But if you're where, if you're riding the bike to work and you work at Pizza Hut, it's because you have to. And so the same exact act or the same exact you know material goods or or choices or whatever have different meanings depending on who's who's doing it and and you know the reasons behind it. And 
I think what Rory was getting at there, and this is actually something that I've been struggling with with the luxury beliefs idea. So I think Rory was almost getting at this idea of what's called counter signaling. Mm -hmm. So if you look at um, the research in, I believe this is an economics research, um, signaling is basically I'm trying to tell you information about myself, not necessarily consciously. Um, you know, the clothes that I wear, the way that I speak. Um, my interests and so on. Those are all signals. I'm, I'm leaking information about myself to you. But counter signaling is sort of deliberately trying not to impress you. So I'm trying to impress you by trying not to impress you, basically. And so if I'm a uh, you know, if I'm the chief executive and, and, you know, maybe the dress code at my firm is, you know, suit and tie, but I'm the chief executive and I co come into work wearing sweatpants and a t-shirt, I'm counter signaling to you that I'm so high up here that I don't need to impress anyone. Um, there's some other research on this too, with, um, you know, sort of related to, to the stuff that I do, the PhD dissertations. So, you know, at the end you have to produce this 200 page manuscript of all the work that you've done throughout your PhD. And researchers found that PhD students at lower ranked colleges use um, more complex vocabulary in their dissertations, whereas PhD students in uh, top tier universities use uh, more simple, less complex language, less jargon. And their explanation was basically that for students at the top tier colleges, they don't feel the need to impress anyone with their intelligence. You know, they can say, well, I already attended this great university, so I can just explain my ideas in a more simple way. Um, whereas people at the lower tier universities may feel this pressure to signal their intelligence. So with the luxury beliefs, there's a little bit of a mixture. It's not an airtight claim that the upper class will always try to differentiate themselves from the lower mm -hmm. classes. And sometimes they'll even adopt some of the mannerisms of the uh, lower classes or even the underclass. Uh, in whatever, maybe sometimes the way that they dress or the way they talk, they'll adopt some of the um, the slang, for example, of the lower classes when they talk to one another. But um, they really, I think of it as almost like a three-tier system where they're sort of like the lower end, the middle, and the top. And so the, the, the lower end, they already know they're at the bottom. And so they're trying to, to some degree, uh, emulate the middle. And the middle is trying to emulate the top. The top is trying to differentiate themselves from the middle. And so one way they can do this is by mimicking the mannerisms and habits and tastes of the bottom, right? Because no one is going to mistake an upper class person for being at the bottom, but they might mistake them for being in the middle. And so what they're really trying to do is uh, differentiate themselves from that middle, the sort of uh, conventional, the typical person. So if I'm a, an elite Brit, for example, I think about, well, who's the conventional sort of person living in Britain? He's probably like some lower middle class Brexiteer. Um, and so I'm definitely going to try to show you that I'm not like, like one of them. Yeah. This is a, a point that was much discussed over the last four years that, um, that this reminded me of was the idea that the, uh, the 2016 election in the USA um, went the way it did because, and if I'm trying to hang this onto your theory, um, because the Democratic Party had adopted a set of beliefs that were were not intended to be uh, part of the mainstream, like it's an elite belief system, like you were saying, and that's part, you could argue that that's the belief system that uh, Hillary Clinton, Senator, Secretary Clinton, was running her campaign on, uh, and again. I started with this, started this with a disclaimer about my uh, being a frustrated intellectual. So I'm, fr I'm prepared for anyone to say there's a massive hole in that theory. But what, what do you think? Well, you know, yeah, I, I think that in general, you know, and, and other people have made this point, uh, including someone that I'm actually a fan of, David Shore. Uh, he's a political analyst. He's a Democratic uh, political analyst. Uh, so he sort of, you know, he works for the left, but he has... Um, pretty interesting and sober analyses of, of what happened in 2016 and and what's been happening even in 2020. Uh, no one expected that election to be so close in 2020, and yet it was. And, you know, they basically argue that the Democrat Party is sort of pulling away from the median voter from the center and going into more sort of, you know, unusual beliefs, you know, unusual from the perspective of someone who didn't attend a fancy college and, you know, doesn't spend their time uh, on Twitter. So... I mean, you know, one of, one of these ideas, uh, 
you know, I, I think like, well, there, there are many of them, but I think a more recent one that is pretty controversial among the elite, but I don't think it's at all controversial. I think it's just viewed as silly among ordinary people is uh, the, what is it, the abolish the police Yes, de- defund the police. Defund, yeah. Well, I think for a while it was abolish, and then <laughs> and they switched to defund because it sounds softer. But yeah. I'm seeing, you know, renewed calls for this. And, you know, there, I mean, there have been polls done, I think, by Pew showing that, I mean, even among African Americans, something like 80, 80 plus percent of them would prefer equal or more police, policing mm-hmm. in their neighborhoods. Mm-hmm. Um, and the people who are we're calling for this, you know, this is you know, people who write for the New York Times or people who write for, and you know, I've, I've actually written for them too. So like, I'm not trying to say I'm better or anything, but like, I have noticed that there's this class division of like the people who are sort of least in need of police protection, police presence are the ones who are calling for, Hey, let's get rid of the police. But if yes. you get rid of the police in the poorest neighborhoods, uh, that is going to inflict a far greater cost on on people who who need that kind of protection. There was even there was a report last summer, sort of at the height of the protests, where um, rich people in New York City fled the, to the Hamptons and they hired private security guards uh, in the midst of you know. So there's ongoing protests and COVID and all this crazy stuff happening in New York City. Uh, you know, the police are spread pretty thin. There's calls to eliminate them. And so the rich people are like, well, I'm just going to go to the Hamptons and hire my own security. You know, yeah. like that's what you can do as, an, as a member of the elite. It's uh, interesting, actually, that um, uh, you mentioned this a lot in, 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 in your written work, the idea that people can be, people can propose or be proponents of ideas that won't affect them, but they're like toy ideas for them. And I'm guessing from the tenor of your work so far that you are are mindful of the long-term effect of things, right? Because you mentioned that there were popular ideas about uh, the futility of monogamy in the 1960s, which then trickled down the, let's call it the class system and had a greater effect on people who weren't like college educated and weren't high income earners. That's where the destruction of the family took its toll. And so I'm wondering if, and we can go into that a bit later because I don't just want to leave that hanging and and unelucidated, you know, and, and not elaborated on, but I'm wondering if you would be willing to make, not exactly a prediction, but just, you know, think through where, where this defund the police idea could end up in 40 years or, or, you know, something like that. I mean, yeah, I, I'm 40 is too long. I apologize. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm always reluctant to make predictions, uh, simply because like, I mean, I mean, even something like COVID, right? Like two years ago, if you and I were having this conversation in April of 2019, who would know that in two years, we would have literally just gotten out of a year long lockdown because of a global pandemic. Like, yeah. you know, it's, it's hard to predict stuff, but, um, you know, I think on the, the current trajectory, you know, just, you know, just as a speculation here, I hope that this idea is too crazy for people to take seriously. Um, and, you know, the, the sort of certain wing, like a, the, the, maybe the activist wing of the elites in the U.S. will sort of like make some noise about it and then it'll sort of fade away, which is, which is sort of what happened in 2020. It sort of flared up and then it's, you know, after the election, I think it sort of faded away, hmm. but I'm, I'm seeing renewed calls for it. So I'm hoping that it, it will go away again. If it does come to fruition, um, I mean, it, it, it's, we're just, it's just going to increase division in American society because the people who have money are going to leave the places where the police aren't policing and go to places where they feel safer right so so if there's no police then they're just going to go somewhere where 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 am i least likely to be a victim of a crime and that's going to be on average people with money people who are like them and they'll just sort of cluster together um i'm hoping that this isn't what happens but we'll see yeah i i noticed actually on um on the subject of being a fan of ideas that (laughs) the, the that wouldn't affect you if they go wrong i've had um a number of friends in my life who've been quite uh who've been quite who have been quite fond of harshly criticizing capitalism and mm. it's always struck me as it's easy to criti- criticize capitalism and economic growth when you're already rich right yeah yeah i mean it's a good point uh, i mean what i've noticed is like i you know so i i grew up in you know i mean you know we can get into this more if you want but like yeah i grew up in foster homes in la and then later i was adopted by this sort of blue collar working class family in this uh, 
uh, you know, poor town in Northern California. And then I joined the military. And throughout all those experiences, I never met anyone who was an avowed communist or who uh, would rail against capitalism or, uh, you know, just sort of denigrated the free market and those kinds of things. Uh, it wasn't until I arrived at Yale that I had heard, you know, someone uh, label themselves as a socialist or a communist or say that capitalism is flawed or evil or whatever. It wasn't and, until you got to one of the top universities in the world <laughs> that you heard that. Right. Yeah. I mean, and, and yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, the places like Yale, I mean, you're, I, I can't remember the, the exact numbers, but it's something like there are more students from families in the top 1% than in the bottom 50%. Oh, wow. So, I mean, it is, you know, these, these are the sort of future ruling class, right? Like the, you know, students from the families of the richest family, you know, people in America. And so, you know, hearing those kinds of things, uh, I mean, it just stunned me. And I think it does connect to what you said before about ideas become these playthings and they don't necessarily think of the consequences of them. And and yeah, like once you're sort of comfortable, once you're set, I mean, the thing is like, if you if you go to a place like Yale or any other fancy college, you can believe whatever you want. I mean, you can have whatever crazy outlandish belief you can possibly dream up. And in all likelihood, your life is going to go perfectly fine and you will never experience any serious discomfort. But yeah. the people who your decisions affect as a member of the elite, your decisions wield outsized effect on society, those people will bear the brunt of those beliefs. Yeah. And so uh, taking that and running with it, uh, just elaborate a little bit on um, uh, on on the idea that you have written about that we, we touched on briefly, which is that the ideas, uh, potentially the ideas of the 1960s, had effects on the broader society in terms of, you know, the 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 family unit. Yeah, the traditional family. Yeah. Yeah. So so in that luxury beliefs essay, I um share some data from uh sort of going back from like nineteen sixty to the present day. And this has been documented by social scientists uh Robert Putnam at Harvard, the, the social scientist Charles Murray and others. So they basically find that in nineteen sixty um, when they look at the social classes within America, they find that upper class Americans and lower class American children, the vast majority of them are raised in two parent homes uh, by both of their birth parents. So in 1960, 95% of upper class uh, families, uh, upper class children were raised in two parent families, 95%. And for uh, working class families too, it was also 95% of children in working class families raised by both of their parents. And then if you fast forward by 2005, uh, for uh, the upper class, the number had dropped to 85% of children in upper class families raised by both of their parents. So it was 95% and it dropped slightly to 85%. So there was a little dip. For working class families, uh, it had dropped to 30%. So it was 95%, identical to the upper class. And then by 2005, it had plummeted to 30%, uh, a massive drop off. Um, and so my claim is that in the 1960s, there was a lot of stuff going on back then, but one of them was the social and sexual revolution uh, around monogamy, around marriage. I mean, if you read some of the, the sort of... Um, uh, accounts of that time. So Joan Didion was a journalist. Uh, she wrote uh, an essay in this, I think it was in the Saturday Evening Post, which later became a book, Slouching Toward Bethlehem. And she writes about, um, I think this was in the mid to late 60s, she travels to San Francisco to Haight-Ashbury, which is like one of the sort of uh, hip neighborhoods uh, of like the hippie countercultural movement of that time. And she writes about like talking to like 16 year old girls who are like having sex with guys and like, you know, boys who ran away from home, girls who ran away from home, like just this, you know, she, she wrote about it in a pretty sober way. But, you know, I, I, I could sense like there was this undercurrent of like, what is going on here? All these teenagers like left home, you know, smoking a lot of drugs, you know, doing a lot of drugs, smoking a lot of weed, hooking up and partying and their parents have no idea where they are. But I think like that, those sort of uh, journalistic accounts are indicative of what was going on in that era. And there was like this moment where divorces among the educated elite had spiked, um, sort of whatever, like there was, there was more divorce, a little bit more delay of marriage and so on, but it had restabilized by the 1980s. 
And what looks like what what it looks like happened is that there was this moment of like let's have this free for all, and then they noticed like oh this is really bad. Let's go back to the way things were. Let's go back to getting married and waiting to have children and staying together for the kids. But that same attitude had already trickled throughout the rest of society. You can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. (laughs) Right. Well, you can't put it back, especially if you don't have much in the way of resources or social connections. Or I mean, so so in a way, the elites were able for themselves to put a little bit of that toothpaste back into the tube. But for the working class, the sort of underclass, uh, it was out and, and it's not going back. So, you know, for the upper class, if you have money, you have education, you have resources, all these advantages, um, you can have fun, you can party a little, you can, you know, whatever, you can snort some coke and hook up with the strangers, whatever, like you can do all that. And in all likelihood, you can sort of get your life back on track, thanks to all these advantages you have. But if you're a member of the working class or the underclass, you don't have as much uh, resources, you... uh, you basically have less leeway in what you can do in terms of you know, your choices about drug use, uh, in terms of sex partners and so on, you're much more likely to get someone pregnant. You're more likely to get addicted. Um, yeah, there, there are all these things that, that sort of stand in the way. And, you know, in the past, I think like family and social norms and all those things were sort of these cultural guardrails to keep the least advantaged among us, like on a, on a, you know, on somewhat of a straight, narrow path, uh, to keep them from making catastrophic mistakes um, like a lot of my friends have made, quite frankly. And, you know, today a lot of those guardrails have, have started to erode. Um, but the upper class are still to, to, to a large extent adhering to them. But my claim is that even if they don't, they'll, they'll in all likelihood be, uh, in a better position than, than the working class. Yes. There are more, um, if you're at the top of the tree, there are more branches to catch on the way down. That's a, yeah, I've never heard that. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> so I I sensed that from reading your stuff that you're quite focused on the family unit and the importance thereof. Not in a sto- uh, not, uh, not in a what do you call it orthodox way. Like oh, it's the way we should do things. It's like it's it's of interest and you know it's part of your research. And we'll I'll ask about why that is in a minute. But one thing I thought was interesting was, um, I mean, my parents divorced, right? And um, recently in one of the last few years, I did, um, the past authoring program, which was developed by, uh, Jordan Peterson and his colleagues at, um, McGill, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a, you know, it's a psych- psychological intervention to help you straighten out your past and understand memories that you still find painful and that are kind of affecting your decisions in the present. So, you mm-hmm. know, if you're, uh, always suspicious about, uh, you know, a partner, uh, let's say, or about their, um, about if you can trust them, which wasn't the case for me. It's a hypothetical. It's an example. If you're always mistrustful of your partner, it's like, and someone has been unfaithful to you in the past, it's like you need to be rigorously write down an account of what happened there so you can understand how it came to be with or without your participation so that you know to avoid it, how to avoid it in the future. And so a lot of people who do the exercise, forgive me if, if you already know this, but they you know, tend to end up writing sort of 40, 45,000 words about their entire life. And then you come to the end of it and it's like, okay, so you've written about all these memories in detail. Now point to the top 10 that are the most significant. And for me, I noticed they all clumped around the moment that my parents separated. All the most significant memories were all there. And mm. so, uh, and, and it, nothing happened to me in a, you know, cliched example of, you know, when the family unit dissolves and it's all, all hell breaks loose. It wasn't like that, but there was psychological long lasting stuff to deal with. And so, uh, that's why it's of interest to me and and why this whole area is of interest. So why don't you tell us a little bit about, you know, why it's interesting to you? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting to me. Well, you know, as you said, like I'm, I'm interested in just as a researcher to study sort of family outcomes, children outcomes, differences, and so on. But it's also, you know, to a large extent personal, just based on the way that I grew up. So I had mentioned before, um, my, so my mother, my birth mother, she was from uh, South Korea. So she was from Seoul and she had come to the U.S. Uh, But, you know, after she had arrived in the U.S., she became addicted to drugs. And as a result of that, she was unable to care for me. And, you know, my birth father, I'd never met him, but he... Uh, took off, you know, uh, either when she was pregnant or shortly after I was born. I have no memories of him. But as a result of my mother succumbing to her drug addiction, I spent, um, 
you know, my early childhood living in uh, several different foster homes in Los Angeles. And, you know, surely, you know, I was sort of go bouncing around these homes. I was moving schools all the time, you know, foster, a lot of these foster homes had, you know, upwards of eight or 10 children living in them. I mean, the foster system in general is pretty, pretty rough, but in LA it was uh, especially uh, just not a good place for, for young kids, but you know, that's where else can you put them based, you know? And so moving in these different homes, going to different schools, I was just a terrible student, never paid attention in class, um, never did homework. I was just sort of like in this, you know, just like, I just didn't care. I didn't care what adults said. I thought rules were dumb. Like I just didn't take any of it seriously. And I was adopted later. Um, you know, like I mentioned before, into this sort of working class town in Northern California. Um, and, you know, for this very brief period of my uh, childhood, I was, you know, I had a mother and a father they, who had adopted me. I had a sister. It was their birth daughter who became my adoptive sister. Uh, but then they got divorced um, about a year after the adoption. And I remember that being really hard for me. Oh. And then... Um, you know, my, my mother raised, you know, raised me for a little while after that, my adoptive father, um, you know, he, he severed ties with me. He was upset with my adoptive mother for leaving him. And so he calculated that by, um, you know, ending his relationship with me, it would hurt her. And this was really hard on me too. And so like, you know, and there's, there's the actual believe it or not, there's like even more to this story, but you I mean, know, even each one of those bad things. Enough, yeah. Because like yeah. I, I've, I've had friends for whose parents used them as kind of weapons in a war between each other. It just, it, it's absolute hell on the kids. It is. Yeah. 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 And I didn't, I didn't even understand that that was, what was happening. My mother didn't explain it to me. So I was a little bit older, but at that time, all I knew was that, oh, this, this guy I've been calling dad for the last year suddenly doesn't want to talk to me. He doesn't answer my calls anymore. You know, and so, you know, as a, as a nine-year-old boy, this was like, you know, it was oh. devastating. And so, you know, after living in all those homes, like not never meeting my father, you know, my birth father, having, you know, very few memories of my birth mother, um, you know, I, I, I thought about this, that, you know, maybe as someone who never really had a, a family, a stable family anyway, maybe I'm the least qualified person to talk about the importance of family. But, um, you know, as someone who thinks a lot about these questions and, and sort of has studied the, the outcomes of, of children, depending on the, the homes that they're raised in, uh, you know, maybe I have some, some qualification to, to speak about this. I mean, it, like, it totally changed the trajectory of my life, I think. I mean, if I go through my high school years too, I mean, it was just a, you know, like it was just like one drunken, you know, period of, of fighting and, and doing drugs and hanging out with friends and fist fights. And, you know, I was always sort of a curious kid and I would read books on my own. I would, I would read the textbooks too. Like the, the class would assign readings and all this stuff. And I would, I would do all of that. Um, but I wouldn't do any of the homework. Uh, I wouldn't do any of the, like the projects or the assignments or anything that they sort of like, you know, anything that was graded, I just didn't do. Um, and so it took me a little while to sort of get back onto this trajectory of taking education seriously when I had avoided it for so long, simply because I associated it with adults who I had instinctively learned to distrust simply because I had been betrayed it so many times as a kid. And I think yeah. a lot of kids... Uh, they could never articulate it. I couldn't have articulated this when I was nine, but I think a lot of kids experience this. It feels like a form of betrayal when mm. uh, you know their families don't prioritize their needs. Mm. Yeah, and so what would you, I mean? Would your teachers, if they saw you now, recognize you uh, <laughs> if the night if they compared you with the nine-year-old Rob? I uh, I doubt. I'm actually Facebook friends with my fifth grade teacher. And and I think, you know, I, I haven't talked to him, but every once in a while he'll make like a comment on a post and I can tell he's just like totally blown away at like yeah, yeah. what happened. Because I mean, when I was in his class, like every, at, at a minimum every week, you know, he had a desk right outside the classroom that he would send the bad kids to just go sit outside at that desk. I was there every week, if not more frequently than that. Um, and so, yeah, he's, he's probably surprised, but you know, if, if he has read anything I've written about, you know, how I grew up, maybe he would sort of understand. I mean, yeah, it's, it's tough. And I think there are a lot of kids out there who grew up the way that I did, whose potential is, you know, maybe being squandered or is not being directed into something healthy and fulfilling, uh, you know, because of, because of the way that they grew up. 
But you, I mean, you've been to Yale and, and, and now Cambridge. So what happened? I mean, how did you make such a remarkable transformation? Well, I mean, it was, it was a long process, honestly. Uh, but, you know, I, so when I was 17, after, like right after I graduated high school, I joined the military. Um, Why did you do that? And that helped a lot. I mean, there were, there were a lot of reasons. I mean, one was uh, simply to get out of the place that I was in. You know, all of my friends were on bad trajectories. By that point, I was sort of dimly aware that I was on this bad path path too. And that if I stayed on it, things were not going to go well. Um, and you know, I would, I would talk about it too. Like every once in a while I'd bring it up with, you know, my, my mom or her friends or something. And I would say like, Oh, I'm thinking about the military. And they would just freak out. They would say like, what? Like, you know, like, that's dangerous. Why would you do that? And hmm. I think like their reaction actually made me want to do it more, uh, yes. just because like the kind of kid I was back then. And so I'm like, Oh, well, if they don't want me to, then I'm, I'm going to do it. Uh, and you know, I, and, and I knew that it was just a way to get out of there. So it was like two, you know, maybe not the best reasons, but they, they were the ones that I had. And so when I was in, you know, I think a lot of people, uh, you know, they, they might attribute, you know, some of, some of the changes that I went through and a lot of young guys, when they go through the military, you know, you learn discipline, you uh, get a sense of responsibility and camaraderie and respect and all these things. And all of those are important. I think all of those played um, a pretty big role in sort of my development and maturity. But I think like less, you know, something that's less talked about or more overlooked is simply the, the role of, of being in a like stable and predictable environment with, um, sort of steadfast rules and consequences. So in high school, I had almost no supervision and that meant that I, I would do any, like if I could do it, I would try to do it. Whereas in the military, it's such a suffocating and constraining environment. It's, it's actually, it's basically jail, honestly, for like the first year, the training is so rigorous and you're, there's no privacy that you're basically in jail for your training. And that was actually good for me. Um, all of my choices had been stripped from me. And so I basically did not have the ability to make choices that would hurt myself or anyone else. Um, simply because I knew that like, if I did X, Y would happen. Uh, no doubt. Like the military has that power. I mean, once you sign on the dotted line, they can do what they want with you. And so I, I knew all of that. I knew that the consequences were real. They weren't just bluffing. And that sort of kept me in an environment where I could sort of just do my own thing, like, you know, sort of go through the, go through the training, do everything I needed to do without acting out or acting impulsively. And this gave me time to sort of mature as well. Just that period of, you know, a few years being in a place where I couldn't make my own choices actually helped me uh, a lot. And so that, like, those kinds of things played a, played a big role in leading me to a understand that like, oh, like I should make some choices about my future, about education, um, being around other people too, who, um, who, who, you know, like, like basically like cared about their own futures too. The kind of people who you're around, that's huge too. Yeah. So I get the, uh, impression that, um, if you're in a world as a young person where you have, as a child, where you have these you have no boundaries and you can go anywhere and do anything, which we spend most of our life thinking is what we want, right? We want absolute freedom. Yeah. Um, and there's also that, that it's freedom and it's chaos at the same time. And so, uh, when you, what you, re, what you needed or what straightened you out, it sounded like was when you finally had some walls and you would run into them and yeah. predict predictably, you knew mm -hmm. the same thing would happen every time. So it lowers like the cognitive burden in, in a way, but I don't understand much about that, but that's what it seems like the effect is. And it's weird because, you know, I run in, I, I frequently run into people who think young people, no, let's go further, children, and if, you know, beyond that, infants are, um, what would you call it? Like, like unconstrained genius or, or, or unconstrained moral, uh, moral benevolence that then gets distorted and corrupted by the adult world. Yeah. And it sounds like you had somewhat the opposite experience to that. It's like the adult world actually shaped, molded, and then gave you an identity that was useful. 
Yeah. 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 I mean, so, so like this, I mean, it's interesting. I, I wouldn't have known this at that time, of course, but like, you know, this is sort of this age old debate in philosophy, this sort of Rousseau versus Hobbes. So, you know, Rousseau was this French philosopher who basically had this idea that, you know, people are born pure and noble and so on. And it's society that corrupts and degrades and makes them into, you know, whatever, uh, criminals or monsters or whatever. And Hobbes, uh, you know, these are, this is somewhat simplified, but Hobbes was this English philosopher who said the opposite is the case. Like men are beastly and evil and cruel and corrupt and society sort of, you know, this Leviathan, the government, the state sort of gets us to behave with the threat of yeah. force and punishment and whatever. And, you know, I think both of those, you know, neither one of those are completely true or false, but, um, I think in my case and for most children, I think, uh, you know, being able to run completely free with no adult supervision. I mean, if, like, I mean, there are, there are things that I did where, you know, I, I should be, you know, either dead or possibly in jail or whatever. And it's just because of luck. I mean, that's another thing, you know, people say, you know, how did you get here? Well, you know, we don't talk about luck that much, but like a lot of it was just pure luck that I have friends who did the same things that I did and uh, they ended up in jail. Uh, drinking and driving is a simple example. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I was probably drunk more often than sober when I was driving when I was 17 years old, but it was just because of luck and circumstance and whatever that I didn't get caught. But I have yeah. friends who did the same thing and they got into an accident and someone got hurt and whatever, and they ended up, you know, uh, paying, paying paying the legal consequences for that. So That's mad that yeah. you had friends who ended up in jail and then instead you volunteered for something you described as jail. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think that's there, there's an interesting parallel there where they were sort of forced to go to jail. Whereas, you know, in a way, I didn't know it was going to be like this, but I sort of chose to go to jail. And I think that was like, you know, the you know, the military as as like a form of jail. And I think I needed that. And and it, it became like you know a sort of pseudo parent for me, where like I here are the rules, here's what's expected. Don't do this. You're supposed to do that. And it sort of like holds your hand, like in addition to the training and the job and everything, like even very small things like how to pay your bills and how to like, you know, whatever, how to finance your car, like all these kinds of small, simple things. They, there are um, uh, whatever structures in place to help with that. And yeah, so that was, that was huge in like helping me to sort of become an adult was, yeah. was doing that. But a lot of young guys don't have that. I mean, I'm, I'm still in touch with some of my friends from back home and I mean, yeah, I have friends who are like 28 years old, still living with their parents, working part time or not at all, like just in this weird holding pattern of like somewhere between adolescent and adult, and they're just not really ready to be uh, a full fledged adult now. It's it's very odd to see. And the thing that I often find tempting in those situations, because you know, I have I have friends who uh, with whom I was on a parallel, you know, a, a similar trajectory. And then I made different decisions that took me into hopefully a more positive direction. And I have a tendency to be a bit of an evangelist, which is why I try and keep pay careful attention to my behavior because I can, I'm one of those idiots who can often think, Oh, this thing worked for me. Ergo, it works for everyone. You should all do this. And it sounds like you're not going to these guys and trying to enlist them, you know? Yeah, well, I maybe, maybe I was more of an evangelist when I was younger, but I, you know, it's yeah, for better or worse, I've noticed that almost no one ever took my advice, um, and I think I just sort of stopped. But I mean, I did, I you know, I, I like to think I had some positive effects. So one of my friends from high school, he was on a pretty bad, path. so he actually got really addicted. I mean, well, first he was just sort of an alcoholic, and then he, you know, he replaced that with. Um, online computer games. So he was playing World of Warcraft and that was like his new drug. <laughs> and like he just, you know, for the you know, first seven years out of high school, that's all he did was like he was either drunk or playing games. Um, you know, his girlfriend dumped him. Like he was just in a really bad place. But I think, uh, you know, one way that I might may have possibly, and, and I wasn't trying to enlist him, but he just decided to join the military. And I think it was mm. because I joined. Mm. And this is something that helps a lot too, is, you know, I mentioned before, who's around you? Well, I think like our friends, our peer groups, like if they're doing something, you know, that it, it becomes more real as a possibility for you to do it too. Um, but yeah, I mean, other thing, you know, I've, I've tried to help with, with college and with a bunch of things and, and people just, uh, 
it's it's strange, man. But yeah, they're just not as as interested as you might think to to improve themselves for you know for a lot of reasons. Now, one thing that's uh, I, I I I thought I thought we couldn't have this conversation without kicking over at least one hornet's nest. Um, and one, uh, and I suppose it'll have to, it'll be me that does it because, <laughs> you know, I'm the host, I should take, I should take the responsibility, which is to say that we were talking about fashionable, uh, let's say Vanguard ideas, um, that are untested and that, um, let's say, you know, people of high status and intelligence like, like the idea of playing with, let's just try this new idea out. Um, although often the explanation is not that we're trying out a new idea, but that we're actually, we just, we have, we're now in possession of a perfect idea and we don't need to worry about trying it. It's just, it's, we're now going to release it on the world. And recent, more recently that's been in the form of, um, let's say non-traditional, uh, non-traditional ideas about gender identity. And whilst I don't have any, what would you call it? Intelligent views of my own on that. What I do notice is that I'm already seeing things in, you know, because I have cousins and people who have very young children and I'm already seeing those ideas being given out in primary school as, you know, here's how you should construe the idea of gender, you know, that it's kind of subjective, uh, that it might be different on one day than another. And I don't know what to make of these ideas, but that's why I also think, is it wise to be giving them out to five-year-olds and four-year-olds? It's a question, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not. Uh, I'm not like up to date. I guess on on this sort of gender identity, gender transitioning questions. I mean, I, I've heard and and seen like secondhand things about like yeah, sort of hormone therapy for children and, and surgeries and operations or whatever and all these things. And mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, I, I just I've talked to people who. Uh, so, so my mother, my adoptive mother, is gay, and you know she and her partner um, actually spent part of you know part of my teenage years raising me, and so you know I, I've talked with gay women and and men who have said that when they were young children, um, if if they had existed in the current cultural milieu, they may have gotten the surgery or whatever you know the operation is required. And they say that they would have regretted it because they were gay, but they were just not sure what was going on with them. You know, so, you know, I talked to this guy who said, you know, when I was young, I thought that like, oh, if I like guys, then maybe that means that I'm supposed to be a girl. And maybe when I was a kid, I would have said like, oh, you know, asked his parents like, hey, can I do this operation or this procedure or whatever? And he said he would have regretted it because he likes being a man. He likes being male. He just happens to be gay and likes to be with men. Mm-hmm. Um, and I wonder, like, if if there are dangers in in that, you know, just sort of not thinking through. You know, young children can be confused. They're not entirely sure, and to put them through something like like a you know ir- irreversible procedure is maybe maybe detrimental. I remember hearing this, um, you know, v- very interesting. I think this was. Deborah So, the neuroscientist, she talked about um, the role that porn might be playing for young women. Um, so let's see if I can reproduce what she said. She said something like, you know, basically, like, I mean, there's actually data on this, that basically young, young people more and more are learning about sex through the internet and, and through online porn. And she said that it's possible that some young women, some young girls are um, watching some of this really hardcore internet pornography and thinking like, is that what sex is? Because I don't want to do that. Like, I don't want to, you know, I don't want that to be what sex is like. It just looks horrible. And so in response, they claim to be transgender or intersex or something like they, they claim a different identity so that they don't have to. Uh, partake in what they think is is you know that that's what sex is like is through what the, the on normal the sort of heterosexual view of the world looks unappealing yeah right it looks it looks scary or dangerous or whatever and like I can yeah. imagine that especially like I mean kids can access this stuff so young now this isn't you know it's not like teenagers watching this like nine year olds have iPhones now and they can see anything and I can imagine like consuming enough of that might warp your view around relationships and sex and all those kinds of things so. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I don't have much, much more on the the gender kind of question, but you know, these are these are things that I you know just sort of heard from from others. 
No, but what's interesting about um, hanging it back onto your 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 theory that you're developing um, is that I've noticed that one of the things that we love to do most of all is to tell other people off. Put simply, you know, we like to have a reason to be uh, morally sanctimonious about other people in general. That's what we, 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 we kind of live for. We love watching soap operas because it's like real life drama with fake people that you can complain about. And reality TV is the same. We love me and my friends, my flatmates. We during the lockdown, this one, we started watching Below Deck, which is a kind of, uh, you know, invasive look at what it's like to work on a luxury yacht. And, um, and it's that that's just it's a it's an overwhelming impulse we have. We want to know why, how we want to find ways that other people are misbehaving and identify it. Uh, I don't know much more about. I don't know anything about why that would be. I don't have any theories. I haven't done any thinking on that. But what I noticed is that let's say you're the old leisure class where you could you know status was displayed in terms of let's say. Uh, the accoutrements that you could have, the kind of the way that you could dress, also the the etiquettes that you had learned as a result of being a member of the upper class. You knew how to speak. Uh, yeah. My uh, My Fair Lady, the musical, is about this. It's can we train, uh, you know, a commoner to be like us? Um, whereas now, as you said, those are more like morally, you know, morally sanctimonious beliefs um, that distinguish us and. Uh, it's a very, very, it's a very easy, it's very easy to tell other people off by launching a new idea on them that they've never heard, a new way of construing the world that they find scary and confusing. Uh, <laughs> if you take that as a signal of their ignorance and their malevolence, then you've, you've got a, a shortcut to finding a new enemy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, there does seem to be, you know, some, I, so there's a interesting book that was written, I think, last year called Grandstanding. And uh, there's two philosophers, uh, Justin Tosi and Brandon Warmke, I think is his last name. And it's all around this idea of people who basically morally grandstand and sort of signal how great they are by sort of broadcasting their moral views and condemning other people and showing other people what they're doing wrong and why they're wrong and so on. And... You know the way that I think about that is it's it's not unlike um, like a peacock uh, displaying his tail feathers, you know, sort of showing you uh, something. They're trying to communicate something, so the peacock is trying to communicate its its sort of health and fitness and so on. And look look at these beautiful feathers I can produce. Look how great I am. Uh, not not consciously, and humans do this with their sort of moral grandstanding when they condemn someone or talk about how great they are, or how so and so, you know, when I say that what this person did was wrong, what I'm, the subtext of that is I would never do that. That's how great I am is that yes, exactly. you know, I'm showing you. And, and so this is also communicating this sort of information. I'm trying to impress you and, and say, you know, how, these certain qualities about myself, not again, not necessarily consciously. I don't think people are calculating no. how to look good to other people, but it's sort of second nature and we don't always think about it. And so, yeah, I think like, you know, the research on this is, is fascinating because a lot of grandstanding, it overlaps with other psychological constructs like, like narcissism. Uh, there was a recent paper that came out last year uh, on, on victim signaling. Uh, basically, you know, researchers constructed this scale asking people questions like, you know, how much does it upset you if people like you aren't represented in XYZ or, you know, mm. do you ever feel like society treats you and people like you unfairly, blah, blah, blah. Um, and it was the sort of scale of victimhood. And what they find, find is that, you know, victimhood overlaps, you know, highly correlates with what's called the dark triad personality traits. The, so the dark triad is psychopathy, Machiavellianism, and narcissism. And so these are basically, you know, so psychopathy is um, sort of callousness and, and sort of emotional coldness. Machiavellianism is like uh, duplicitousness and sort of strategically uh, thinking about your social interactions and of course, narcissism is this sort of being self-absorbed. Uh, and so people who uh, 
you know, sort of signal their victimhood and think a lot about their victimhood, preoccupied with it, or, you know, at least report being this way, are also high on these other three traits. And what mm -hmm. the researchers suggest is th they're not denying that real victims exist. Real victims do exist. Of course. But what the researchers claim is that in the modern West, um, because we have this culture of uh, sympathy for victims and because victimhood is a way to gain uh, moral credibility. So if I want to get you to listen to me, I'll tell you about how, you know, how tough I have it or whatever, and you'll be more likely to drop your guard and take my claims more seriously. The researchers suggest that in, in sort of like any given social milieu, uh, what, what, are the what, what are the behaviors you need to enact in order to uh, extract rewards? Uh, and if you drop hard, high dark triad people in that environment, they will quickly pick up on what do I need to enact in order to extract material rewards, uh, social rewards, sexual rewards, professional rewards, whatever. And in 2020, 2021, a good way to do that is through, you know, sort of finding reasons why you're a victim and broadcasting it. And I think that this is a very interesting idea. And, you know, to, to some degree, I think there's, there's a lot of truth in it. I mean, honestly, um, you know, a lot of the elite, a lot of students and graduates of top tier universities and, and, in, and in other circles too, but the ones that I'm most familiar with are, are in these universities that um, they are very good social strategists and they understand what they need to do to get ahead. And I think there's some of this going on, honestly. Um, and I can't say it's ineffective. I mean, it is like objectively it, it works and then they're doing what works. Yes. Um, but, uh, well, no, it's not exactly, but uh, if you watch, if you watch people, uh, without prejudice, um, and, you know, if you kind of, if you notice how often they display a certain type of behavior, like, um, so for example, I have, uh, I know a number of people who would claim overwhelmingly to be compassionate or, or maybe abundantly, not overwhelmingly, that would be their most frequent claim or, mo or the most frequent behavior they talk about being important, being compassion. Uh, the actual, the actual, um, appearance of their behavior m more often than not looks quite angry and aggressive. It's like everyone needs to be more compassionate. Fuck's sake, you know what I mean? <laughs> it looks so. It's like what the how they're acting is very different to the kind of script that they're reading. What do you think of that kind of thing? I I think there's something to that. You know, I I um, was recently reading this paper on person perception. So in social psychology, person perception is basically like how you view others and what. Uh, so a lot of the research is like what. Well, is it about others that you're picking up on that makes you judge them in a certain way? But what the researchers in this paper were interested in is what are the what what are the features or characteristics of the observer? How does that affect how they view others? So, you know, for example, if I'm a, a whatever, if I how how old I am might affect how I view other people or uh, what kind of activities I'm engaged in. But the researchers measured things like personality and education and all these things, and one of the sort of you know, to me, somewhat surprising uh, findings is that they found that uh, the more educated people were, the lower their opinions of other people, their impressions of strangers and others. Uh, you know, these are just, yeah, sort of, uh, what, I think they had them look at uh, social media profiles and images and people they didn't know and basically asked them questions about like, how friendly do you think this person is and how nice and compassionate and all these kind of qualities. The more educated a person is, uh, the more cold they are toward others. And I think this might get at what you're saying here, uh, that you know the people who, who love to broadcast their compassion, who on average tend to be more educated. I mean, if you look at the data on uh, you know, who's more likely to, to be on Twitter. So on average, Twitter users are, are more educated in the first place, but then like the people who spend all day on it tend to have white collar jobs who can afford, you know, if you work uh, at, a, uh, at a ticket booth or operate machinery all day, you can't, you know, scroll on Twitter. Um, those kinds of people tend to have higher education. And I think they may have this sort of lowly view of others and they need to be guided or shepherded toward the light. Um, yeah, I think there's some truth to that for sure. It's, it's interesting. You identified in the New York Times as a uh, conservative, and I, I thought this was quite a quite brave and be quite interesting. I thought brave because certainly in my 
uh, the the, the circles I move in, I work in the creative industry and I am under 30. Most people I know tend to not only be more liberal, but also quite quite, um, distrustful and even just, 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 they don't like conservatives, full stop. And it's become a kind of... uh, Sla- it's become a, it's become a word conflated with just nasty or like dispassionate or self serving, and I get the impression that you are on a, not on a mission whether you've specified this or not to kind of bring some sobriety back to conservatism. It's like conservatism proper, not the Trumpian overblown <laughs> kind of re- U.S. Republican thing that we're so used to. Or these yeah, over here, our, we think of conser- conservative as kind of cronyistic private school uh, looking after their own interests. There's a bunch of news stories coming out at the moment about the health secretary uh, being tied up in, uh, you know, awarding contracts that benefit him financially. Uh, so, so, so just, you know, f- take us through uh, for a little bit why you felt like, you know, conservative was the kind of identifier that you liked and what you think of the term more generally. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so when I, when I wrote that, uh, that piece, so, so the, the headline was why being a foster child made me a conservative. So writers don't usually choose the headlines, the editors do. Uh, and I was a little nervous about that headline at first, although now I think it's actually pretty appropriate uh, for reasons that I, I can explain in a second. But uh, the, I, you know, the label conservative, of course, it, you know, everyone brings their own sort of perceptions and bias to it. I don't, yeah, like you said, I don't necessarily mean the Trumpian, I don't even necessarily mean politically conservative more like a behavioral conservative well yeah behavioral or or philosophical conservative in that um i spent much of my undergrad reading philosophers like edmund burke or uh the the, uh, economist and social theorist thomas Sowell, uh and what they what their ideas are basically saying uh to somewhat simplify is that people in the past weren't dumb uh, culture isn't dumb. Like the practices of people, they worked for a reason. If something stands the test of time, it's foolish to think that, you know, you can suddenly pop into existence and say like, oh, that thing that people have been doing for thousands of years or hundreds of years or whatever, I know better than centuries of tradition and history and ritual. Again, often um, buttressed by a kind of, so you talk about the status status signaling in, in, across space, across other people, but we also signal across time. It's like everyone before me, they were all just <laughs> ignorant and stupid. They didn't know what I know. Exactly. Yeah. And so, so of course, like reading, reading those sort of more, say, conservative philosophers and thinkers, but then also reading some of like the anthropological and psychological research. Um, I'll give you a, a brief example. So I think this was in uh, the Harvard biologist, Joe Henrik, wrote this book, The Secret of Our Success, a few years ago. And he talks about the, so these, I think these were European anthropologists, they were Westerners in any case, went to this like hunter-gatherer tribe and they found that like, oh, these... Um, uh, the, this this community, they they cook their manioc, which is like this sort of starchy root vegetable in a certain way. You know, you ha- they you know they boiled it and then they did this and then there was like a ten step procedure before they would eat this. And these Westerners said like, why are you guys eating it? Like, why are you guys going through this ten step process? Like, and they basically said like, oh, can't you just boil? it and eat it because they in, in their view like once it was boiled it looked like it was good it was cleansed it was whatever and they and that's what they did so these westerners just you know i don't need to do those 10-step process that these you know these uh whatever these backwards tribesmen are doing i can do my own thing and about three to four weeks later a lot of them were getting sick if i recall some of them might have i think some of them died and when they and the reason why they did this, why they skipped those steps, they asked these these uh, you know hunter gatherer tribes members. They said, "Why are you doing this?" And the response was, "This is how we've always done it." And they didn't like they themselves didn't understand why they're doing it. They were just following this ritual, this tradition, this ten step procedure. And the Westerners are like, "Well, if you can't explain it, then that just means that it's worthless. So we can just throw that out." And then weeks later, they got sick, they got poisoned, whatever. Uh, and they didn't realize that like, oh, each one of those steps, there's a reason for it, even if they didn't necessarily understand or couldn't explicate the, the reasons for it or outline it in a scientific, understandable way. There was still a reason why those things were being done. And it kept this tribe alive and kept their ancestors and their descendants alive, this procedure. And so one of the points that Henrik, the, the author of the book, makes is that like Westerners are no different. There are things that we do. Uh, there are... Um, 
institutions and practices and norms and rituals that we all engage in. And we don't know why we do them. We don't know the value of them. Uh, and, you know, he doesn't say this, but I inferred that if you get rid of them, you don't know what you're doing, basically. Mm. You might be like those Westerners in that tribe thinking, oh, I can throw all these steps out of the way and I can just eat the manioc after one step. Yes. Um, Yes, and I think that this is a this is sort of my view of conservatism is is respecting the wisdom of of the past and of people who came before cultures who came before, and again, this isn't like I don't want to say that like this means that everything in the past is always good and we should never yeah. change. Yeah. Uh, there should be some change. I mean, change is part of the part part of the way that we sort of understand the world and and make our way through, but I just think we should be careful about it and not always think that. X happened in the past, so therefore it has to be a bad thing. Um, which I noticed this pattern of thinking a lot with my um, a lot of my friends from college and so on. Like they think that, oh well, because our grandparents did this and our grandparents were uh, more bigoted than we are, everything they do is bigoted, and therefore we don't have to do those things. Yeah. Uh, and I don't think that's true. I think you can be more careful about like, okay, so that was probably not a good thing that they used to do, but maybe there's some value in this other thing. Yes, it's like I think you mentioned as well in one of the in one of your pieces that I read that a lot of modern educated rich uh, Westerners have this approach to religion. It's like, oh, it's like a load of uh, crap from the past because they didn't have science. Well, now you know you can just just boil it. <laughs> you know, it's just yeah, yeah. just explain the, the how the world works, and then you can have the meaning, the the purpose, the spiritual home, the community. You can have all of that without any of the tradition and the stories. Yeah. 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 I think that's, uh, that, that's, a, that's pretty, pretty apt. I mean, religion is like, yeah, I mean, the, the way that religion functions in people's lives, uh, I mean, it's, it's existed in every single culture throughout history, even worldwide today, more people are religious than not. Um, and so to, but, but if you are a member of the educated elite, uh, you're going to meet more people who are non-religious or atheist or agnostic and, you know, I, I think a lot of people have difficulty understanding that that you are the weird one. You yes. know, you are the yeah. odd one out, uh, both historically and cross culturally. You, as this you know Western person with a college degree who doesn't believe in God, like you are very you are like the alien here who doesn't believe in those things. Uh, other people would view you as a very strange outlier uh, compared to to most humans. But as I think you pointed out in another one of your pieces, that the people may say they are not explicitly religious, but people or uh, people are, <laughs> I don't have a more intelligent way to say this than people are all religious and they will find a home for their religious behavior. Uh, you know, and you pointed out that uh, often we don't like to attribute failure, let's say the failure of the individual to individual circumstances. We like to attribute it to something uh, faceless, uh, intangible, but all encompassing. And that always looks to me a bit like a God or something like that. It's like, it's just the system that keeps people, you know, or that's not helping these people. Or it's, it's cursing God in a weird way. That's fascinating. Yeah. I, I, I had never thought of it that way, but, but I think there's something to that. Uh, you know, yeah, a lot of educated people, you know, they, they don't believe in God uh, or, or spirits or any of those things, but they're happy to blame, you know, structural forces or the system or, um, you know, these, these sort of implicit beliefs that sort of affect everyone else, society, you know, these sort of uh, intangible foes that hold people back. Um, and, and that was something, yeah, that, that I had mentioned in that piece uh, as well, mm. that, you know, of course, like, Every person's circumstance is different, but even within those sort of narrow constraints, you still have the the ability to exercise choice. Um, this was something, and I, I just read this earlier. Funny enough, uh, uh, it was uh, discussing uh, Viktor Frankl's book *Man's Search for Meaning*. Uh, so Frankl was, uh, I think, he was an Austrian psychiatrist who spent, uh, you know, years in concentration camps. Uh, you know, in the 1930s, 1940s. And in his book, he states that um, even in this sort of most dire and bleak 
uh, possible environment, like that's basically hell on earth. Even then he noticed that certain people made certain choices, certain people adopted certain mindsets. Uh, there was variation, right? Like it wasn't like, oh, everyone is in this environment and therefore they only behave in this way. He noticed that even there, people made choices and decided to do certain things that were beneficial to themselves or to others. And some people behaved very selfishly and... So of course, like environment is not everything, right? Like that was the same horrible environment and people acted differently. And I think this is important to keep in mind. You can keep those two thoughts in mind that yes, you can be disadvantaged and live in deprived or, or, or in unstable circumstances, but you still have the ability to, to choose what to do within that, uh, that situation. And, and oh yeah, I just wanted to talk about, so, so the title of that, that New York Times piece, you know, why being foster child made me a conservative. The reason why I later grew to like that title was uh, because of some some more recent research, uh, specifically interesting about political views. And so what the researchers found is that, um, so they measured uh, childhood instability, uh, which is basically, um, you know, a variety of, of, of items in this, in this scale. Uh, things like, how many times did you relocate as a child, move to different homes? Uh, how, you know, did your parents get divorced? Uh, how many different partners did your parents have when you yes. were growing up? Um, something, uh, I think like the number of jobs your parents had too. So basically like this whole entire sort of uh, checklist of, you know, how sort of chaotic was your early life? And what the researchers found is that that correlated with political conservatism. Uh, so the more unstable people's childhoods, the more likely they were to identify as a conservative politically. Mm. Um, and this, if I recall it, this was controlling even for family income. So if two people have the same exact family income growing up, but one of their childhood is more unstable, they're going to grow up to be more likely to be a conservative. And of course, you know, who, they, they don't have a firm, they didn't offer a firm reason for why this might be the case. But one possible reason that I, I thought about as I was reading that paper was that, you know, typically conservatism, I think, is associated more with stability, with sort of sticking with the tried and true, with the things that you know work. You're not going to try to experiment too much with new things. You, you want the familiar. And if you spend your most formative and sensitive years in a state of uncertainty and in instability and fear... Uh, when you grow up, you may just be more sympathetic to things that are comfortable and familiar and uh, less threatening, say. Yeah, it, and there's also um, there was a kind of uh, moral to the story in a in a in a in a sense to what you said about uh, children from less stable environments. Is that right? It turned out to be yeah. more conservative. So you could you could say to people who are. Uh, egging on radical changes. Like if you want everyone to be conservative, a good way to do it is to destabilize everything. Yeah, yeah, it's funny. I was talking to a friend of mine. He's a grad student here at Cambridge and he's he's a pretty, pretty uh, you know, firm liberal. And I told him, you know, if you want more people to become, because, because the flip side of that finding is that the more stable your childhood, the more likely you are to be a liberal, right? Like yes. if you grew up in comfort and you never had to want for anything, uh, maybe you, you will grow up to like want to shake things up a little and, and see what happens if you do X, Y, or Z, something new. So I told him like, look, man, if you want to, more people to be liberal, what you should want is for every child to grow up in a very stable home and then they'll grow up to be liberal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so this is maybe my, my sort of conservative argument to, to create more liberals. Yeah, well, it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a great place to jump off in that case because I, I want to continue the conversation, I want to deepen the conversation, and so I think we should do that next time in person. So when, when, the, when our government allows for that, I'll drive down and we'll do this again, what do you say? Yeah, absolutely, I'm down. Great stuff. Rob Henderson is a uh, PhD student at Cambridge. Is there anything, have you, have you got a grand work, have you got a book that you're working on you want to tell us about? Uh, the book's still in the works, uh, it'll be out next year, but uh, yeah, people can follow me at on twitter uh, at rob k henderson and my website is rob k henderson.com and not me did you say you're 28 years old uh, so i'm 30 30 old man yeah. I'm, I'm 28 no but, um, <laughs> yeah I mean, it's coming it's coming so not many 30 year olds get recommended as intellectuals by rory sutherland so with a lot of my audience being uh, advertising types that's a, a great honor you should be uh, happy with that <laughs> yeah yeah well yeah i'm a big fan of rory's uh yeah read his stuff and listen to everything he produces so 
Great. Well, uh, look, I wish you the best of luck with what you're uh, getting on with. And um, we'll put links to your New York Times articles and such in, in the description uh, for the video and, and for the podcast. So, uh, yeah, uh, all, all the best with what you're doing. And I look forward to speaking to you again. All right. Thanks so much. Cheers, man. Okay, bye bye.